Good afternoon. I'm Jay. This is Lisa, Matthew, and Katie, and we looked at tree in gray water from the Oregon Country Fair uh, through subsurface wetland and public plantation. Our overall objective was to take the shower effluent from the showers and treat them on site using natural processes. Throughout this presentation, we'll be going through the gray water logistics, like the flow rate and different volumes of water that we're going to have, along with the regulations with these gray water and the subsurface wetlands and the public plantation infiltration and the different social benefits and economics. So before we get too deep into the numbers, let's take a quick look at the overall system. This is a plan view of the site. Um, the Ritz up there is the shower area, and from there the water will be collected in a storage tank, which will be pumped down through a two-inch pipe down to the subsurface wetland, which is represented by the little red box there. And in there will be treated for total suspended solids and biochemical oxygen demand. And from there, it'll be collected in a collection pond just outside the subsurface wetland, and it'll be pumped over to the pop-up plantation, which will be transpired into the air. Here's a side view of the whole system. As you can see, the shower area is up there, and it goes in the storage tank, which is about four feet deep. And then from there, it'll be pumped 2,000 feet to the subsurface wetland, and it'll be collected in the holy pond, which will be six feet below the surface, and then it'll be pumped about 400 feet to the pop-up plantation. And a key note here is that no water will be entering the Long River. So here's a quick look of the different numbers we have. Um, we got about 24,000 gallons per day during the fair, which is, the, which is three days long. And about 7,200 gallons per day during the setup and takedown, which is about eight weeks during the summer. Our peak flow is 40, 000, or 40 gallons per minute, which we found by taking the 16 shower heads and multiplying it by two and a half gallons per minute. Um, we found 16 shower heads total and two and a half gallons per minute because the Energy Policy Act of 1997 says that that's the max flow rate for shower heads. And we assumed um, about 10 hours per day during the fair, the showers will be running. It's about four hours in the morning, four hours at night, about two hours midday, then spread showering here and there. And then during the setup and takedown, we assumed three hours per day because Bear Pitts, one of the fair elders, has told us that. So in order to determine what kind of pumps we need, we looked at the head loss. Um, our government equation right up, is right up there for the friction head loss. We found this by taking the length of the pipe, the diameter, and the velocity at the 40 gallons per minute flow rate. And then we found the friction factor by taking the Reynolds number, and we calculated that. And we plugged that into the Moody diagram, and combined the, relative, or the Reynolds number with the relative roughness, and found a friction factor of 0 0.02. So plugging all those numbers into the equation, we found a head loss of about 52 feet to the wetland, and about nine feet to the poppers. And combining this with the elevation from the storage tank in the collection pond, gave us about 55 feet of total head loss to the wetland and 15 feet to the poppers. And these numbers were used to find the different uh, pumps that we needed. We chose to go with the Liberty automatic pumps. Automatic because the flow rate would be variable, so we don't want to keep turning on and off the pumps manually. And we chose a one and a half horsepower pump to the wetland and a half horsepower pump to the poppers based on these performance curves down here. The red line is what the head required, is what we needed. And the orange line is what um, will actually pump the max head. So as you can see, the orange line is above both the red lines, which is good. Uh, these pumps can handle up to two inch solids, which is good because the showers usually will have grit, dirt, and things like that that will be going through, so we don't want anything to get clogged. And they're both submersible, so they'll be in the storage pond or in the storage tank and in the collection pond. And to the wetland, the power used will be about 3,500 watts, and to the pop will just be about 1,400 watts. So now that we've looked at all the different fill rates, let's at least we're going to talk about the wetland processes. All right. So uh, first, let's talk about some regulations. So there's three types of gray water, um, and this is all with the Oregon ODEQ regulations. The first type is just untreated gray water, and it can only be used for subsurface irrigation. And then there's type 2, which is gray water that's been treated, and BOD and TSS levels are below 10 milligrams per liter. And that can be used for drip irrigation or landscape ponds. And then the third type is type 3, which is type 2 that has also been disinfected. So our subsurface treatment wetland will treat to type 2 gray water. And then there's three different types of permits. Um, and because the fair is not a residence, we'll be using a type 3 permit, which has costs associated with it that Katie will speak of later. 
So now a little bit about how a subsurface wetland works. There's multiple components. The bottom is an impermeable liner so that no gray water gets into the groundwater. And then above the liner is the media, and that's the main treatment method, is the biofilm that forms on the gravel. And then above that, we'll have porous membrane and then plants. And the plants are to increase the oxygen level in the gravel and also just for aesthetics. And two important things to note is that, as I said, no uh, gray water will get into the groundwater and also the wetland will be totally subsurface and not accessible to the public. All right, so here's the calculations. The first calculation was to determine the reaction rate given a conservative um, summer temperature of 60 degrees. And using that value and the estimated BOD influent of 65 milligrams per liter and the required effluent being 10 milligrams per liter, the retention time of 2.2 days is calculated. And for future calculations, we'll use a retention time of three days. So here's the dimensions and volume. Um, the volume was determined just by multiplying the flow rate of 24,000 gallons per day by the hydraulic retention time. And then from the volume, the area was calculated using a depth of two feet um, because that was um, an EPA paper said that was a good depth so that the plants can reach the bottom when there's lower flow and they'll still be able to get water. And then also taking into account the porosity of the gravel as 40%, the area needed was is 12,000 square feet. And our aspect ratio will have a length to width of 2 to 1, which would be 160 to 80. And then surrounding the wetlands will be uh, berms with a height of 4 feet, a top width of 3 feet, and a slope of 3 to 1. So now we know a little about wetlands. Matt will talk about what happens to the water after it leaves the wetlands. We designed our poplar plantation on an economically and technically a successful poplar bioremediation project in Springfield called BioCycle Farms. Uh, they used a density of planting about 220 trees per acre. So with a 17 acre poplar uh, plantation is which what, what we designed for, we have about 3,800 trees. With some geometric calculations, we found the spacing for the poplars at about 14 feet apart. And furrow irrigation will be used to irrigate these uh, poplars uh, from the wetland. So we need to determine what the maximum rate that we can pump into the poplars so that there's no uh, excess ponding and water moving around where we don't want it to move. So we use the soil infiltration rate to find the soil infiltration rate based on a green act equation. And what we find is when soil is saturated, which it is in for irrigation, that the length of the saturated zone, the L term, outweighs the H naught uh, which is the, the depth of the furrows and the wetting front, which is the length of uh, the width of the furrows. So the infiltration rate will equal about six tenths of an inch per hour, and we're basing this off of a uh, web soil survey from the US uh, DA, or US GS web soil survey. So in order to find the total amount of water that uh, could potentially be infiltrated into the soil, we multiply that by the area of the furrows to get about 1.4 million gallons per day. So we need to find whether or not the soil, uh, the transpiration of the poplars is lower than that uh, to find the total amount that we can pump into the poplar plantation. So a mature poplar uh, at about four years transpires at approximately 0.28 inches per day. And up until four years, uh, the Transpiration is a function of age, as you can see on the table down at the right. Since our poplars, one third of our poplars will be harvested every four years, the transpiration rate will be at its lowest every four years, as you can see on the graph. But at its lowest, it's 70,000 gallons per day, which will be sufficient enough to treat the 24,000 gallons per day that the RIPS uh, provides. The Biocycle Farm, which is what we're basing it off of, harvests their poplars at about 12 years and can get a uh, harvest of about 20,000 board feet per acre. And that's what Katie talks about in her economic analysis for 
uh, income. What we have here is a diagram of our harvest schedule for the first cycle of 12 years. After 12 years, every harvest, every third will be one, four years apart from each other, and harvested the oldest of 12 years. So as you can see, we're planting all the trees at the same time, and we harvest one third every four years. Now, Katie will talk to you a little bit about how this affects the fair and the Benita community in general. Thanks, Matthew. So embedded in our design are a number of social benefits. Um, first of all, elementary school students can visit on field trips and learn about wetland function and wetland species. Secondly, we're going to install an informational kiosk in the northeast corner of the borrow pit, depicted by that yellow star. And at that location, there's not already an energy source, so we're going to install solar panels on the roof of the informational kiosk and then have signage discussing that alternative energy source, as well as wastewater treatment with poplars and treatment wetlands. So we also have to consider the accessibility of that site. And during the fair, there's a temporary footbridge installed across the Long Tom River just north of that site. And there's also a ball field parking area that would um, grant accessibility to the site, which during the rest of the, the year is a hay field. So outside of the time of the fair, as you can see, there's an access road that goes right through the middle of our design. So anyone who is visiting on a field trip or as a volunteer whoops, would have access to this. Third, there's the potential for building community created by volunteer opportunities. These volunteer opportunities include the initial planting of the wetland as, long, uh, as well as replanting over time as necessary. And then also the annual water monitoring uh, to meet the permit requirements that Lisa described to make sure that the effluent is meeting the BOD and TSS requirements that they're less than 10 milligrams per liter. And also we're going to provide beautification. We're transforming this empty pit into a healthy and functional space. So next we conducted a detailed economic analysis to determine the feasibility of our project. So here's a summary of the key components that contributed to this analysis. First of all, we have the water transport, and that includes the pipe and the pump. Then we have the treatment wetland, which is the establishment and construction of the wetland, as well as the maintenance. And then also the poplars, again, planting it and maintenance. Then we also looked at the potential benefits uh, and annual savings presented through our design. Um, and that's mainly driven by treating the wastewater on site and not having to truck it over to the wastewater treatment plant across the street. Um, one of the fair elders uh, let us know that it was about eight cents per gallon of water to be treated. And as you saw in our previous calculations, the fair uses approximately 500,000 gallons of water over the whole time it's um, occurring. So that offers a substantial savings of $40,000. There's also an income potential from um, using the wood that's harvested from the poplars. And as Matthew mentioned, there's a potential for 20,000 board feet per acre of poplar wood harvested. And the fair currently uses wood chips for the paths throughout the site, so wood chips could be created with that wood. Also, there's a couple of vineyards close by, um, Secret House Winery and Lavelle Vineyards, so there's a potential for them using the wood for custom wine boxes. And then there's also a lo local custom sawmill the Long Tom Custom Sawmill, who likes to use local and sustainable wood, so that would be an ideal match with the OCF values. So here's a more detailed look at the costs. So as you can see, the total initial construction will be $265,000, and each of the components have a pretty comparable value. Um, the $69,000 for the water transport is basically due to the installation of the pipe. It needs to be buried at a specific depth and depth and um, use particular fill. The $100,000 for the wetland is mainly caused by the impermeable liner that Lisa talked about to be sure that there is no uh, groundwater contamination. And the $96,000 for the poplars is due to the 4,000 trees that we'll be planting there. Next, the total annual cost is $7,000. Uh, the water transport has a nominal fee of $500. That's mainly due to maintenance um, for leaking or breaks in the pipe or anything. But $1,300 for the wetland is due to the cost of the permits that need to be renewed annually. 
And the $5,300 for the poplars is due to the harvesting and replanting cycle that Matthew described it happens every four years. And that's an annual average spread out over those four years. So the annual income is definitely driven by, or the annual income and savings, by the $40,000 um, saved by treating the gray water on site. And there's also the uh, income from the poplar byproducts that I described. So based on our economic analysis, we were able to calculate the net present value for 30 years of operation of our design. And the net present value is a method for using the time value of money to appraise long-term projects. And we determined that value to be $144,400. So that determines that our design is not only economically feasible, but economically advantageous. So in conclusion, our design has not only makes sense financially, it also offers a solution to reliably treat the shower effluent in a manner that meets ODEQ regulations. So as you've heard, our design makes sense financially, socially, and environmentally. Thank you for your time. Any questions?